hour today giving you some of the highlights of the significant cases pending before the Supreme Court in the term of court that starts uh, next week. This has become something of a fall standard here at Duke, and it is a little bit different this year because we're asking two of our newest additions to the law faculty to do the preview for you. Erwin Chemerinsky, who comes from us uh, from uh, a long and distinguished career at the University of Southern California, is an outstanding Supreme Court advocate in his own right, uh, very active in the civil liberties area in cases pending before the court. Uh, currently has a couple that are on the court's uh, conference docket in September that one or both of which he may tell you about. I don't know yet whether the court will be taking those cases, but he may have something to say about them. And then Neil Siegel, who comes from us fresh from a clerkship with Justice Ginsburg on the court. I don't know how constrained Neil is going to feel about talking about cases uh, that are, the court has this term, but you're about to find out. So I will turn it over to the two of them. They'll Thank you. talk a little bit about some of the cases they've picked out, and then they've told me they'll leave ample time for your questions uh, after the presentation. So let's turn to them directly. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be part of this discussion, to get the chance to do this with Neil. This morning, the nine justices formally came back from their summers. Many of them participate in summer programs from various law schools in Europe. But this morning, they had their first conference where they considered the petitions for review that had accumulated over the course of the summer. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we announced which of these cases they're taking. And next Monday, October 4th at 10 o'clock, October term 2004 will begin. Last year, the Supreme Court decided 73 cases after briefing and oral argument. The year before that, they decided 73 cases after briefing and oral argument. The year before that, it was 78 cases. Now, what makes this so notable is that just about 15 years ago, the Supreme Court was averaging around 160 decisions a term. If you look at the entire decade of the 1980s, the Supreme Court averaged just under 160 decisions a term. If you look at the decade of the 1990s, the Court averaged just over 80 decisions a term. Now, as I said, it's likely this year again, they'll be somewhere in the mid-70s. There's really nothing I'm at liberty to say about the court's business. <laughs> Thank you for having me. There's no way that they worked on each case as much then as they do now. It's just not the case that the court has half the work. Um, I say that only because time is a scarce resource and you figure you have to sleep a few hours a day if you're a justice or a clerk. And they had actually less clerks back then, not, not more. So it is true that the court takes less cases now than it used to, and sometimes uh, people gently chide the Chief Justice for that, but I, I think it would have to be the case that, that, that the decisions uh, these days uh, get, get more scrutiny. I think you, you, fill, you fill the time um, with work. As Irwin said, that the, the justices have been away for the summer, now they're back, and while they're away, the clerks, when they weren't playing playing basketball in the court above the courtroom, they were writing cert petitions. And each week they just pile up and pile up. Over a thousand came in over the summer and the clerks wrote cert pool memos. And that's what the justices were considering at the conference this morning, which is over now. So we know the, uh, the fate of most of the rest of the docket. Um, there'll be more grants as, as the fall unfolds, but I think there'll be, there'll be anywhere from six to 10 probably coming out tomorrow, uh, including possibly uh, one, of, uh, one of Irwin's cases and um, we'll, we'll have a very good, good sense of what the term is going to look like. They say after blockbuster terms that sometimes the court sort of takes a back seat the following term. Last year was, was by most accounts an historic term. This year the court doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. Some of the cases we'll talk about today uh, have certainly the potential to be, to be blockbuster rulings. So to put this in perspective, the court has granted review in 49 cases so far as Neil said, tomorrow, another 6 to 10. Between now and the beginning of January, they'll grant review in the rest of the cases, all of which will be decided by the end of June 2005. What we're going to do is look at several areas. First, we're going to look at the criminal cases, which are some of the most significant ones of the term. Next, we're going to look at the Commerce Clause cases, which are also quite important this year. 
going to talk about some statutory civil rights cases. We're going to talk about some equal protection cases. Give some speculation on what review might be granted in tomorrow and over the next couple of months, and then save the last 15 to 20 minutes for questions. You want to start the criminal cases? Yeah, I'll start with uh, the two cases called uh, Booker and Fan Fan. On October 4th, in a special afternoon session, there hasn't been one in decades, the court is going to decide the constitutionality of the United States sentencing guidelines. Specifically, the, the main question presented is whether the Sixth Amendment right of a criminal defendant to trial by jury is violated when the sentencing judge enhances a sentence based on the United States sentencing guidelines, based on facts that the sentencing judge finds him or herself. That is, facts that were not either admitted by the defendant or submitted to a jury and proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the sentencing guidelines have been around also for two decades. Right? How do we get to this place? Well, some of my colleagues have blamed me because I was at the court when the court rendered its decision in Blakely. I can assure you that um, I, don't have anything, I didn't have anything resembling a vote. Um, <laughs> in Blakely, what the court did was strike down a state sentencing guidelines regime on grounds that call into question the constitutionality of several other state schemes, and more importantly, the federal sentencing guidelines. So while you folks were off enjoying your summers, literally the courts in the federal system around the country have been in chaos. I don't think is, I, I can't, well, I haven't been around that long, but I don't know, I don't think Irwin can, can remember a time in which we've had a summer like this, in which every day, <laughs> oh, you haven't been around that long either. But, Thank you. Okay. Uh, I was trying to be, all right, whatever. Um, your phone's going again. Basically, what you had was the court rendering a decision in Blakely saying that any fact that increases a criminal defendant's sentence beyond the facts that were put in the indictment and proved by a jury, right, any fact that increases the sentence has to be found by a jury. You can't have the judge finding facts. So you can't be convicted of one crime and then have the judge find certain facts like more drugs or obstruction of justice and then bumping up the sentence. In Blakely, there was a statutory maximum of 53 months for kidnapping. And then the judge said, well, I find that you acted with deliberate cruelty and therefore I'm going to bump you up to 90 months. And the court said, no, this is unconstitutional. Right? The intuition, again, is you can't convict someone of one crime and then sentence them to another. And the court, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, used language that uh, was very disturbing from the standpoint of the Sentencing Commission. He says, our precedents make clear that the statutory maximum is the maximum sentence a judge may impose solely on the basis of the facts reflected in the jury verdict or admitted by the defendant. That would seem squarely applicable to the federal guidelines. Uh, last thing I'll say so that we, could, we, can, we can keep moving is that it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to overstate how important this case is. If the court does what is expected, which is strike down the guidelines, you're talking about one of the hugest decisions probably in the history of the court. I mean, I, I, you have tens of thousands of criminal convictions that are currently in jeopardy. And so I don't think that's, um, that's really an overstatement. The circuits are split. It's a deep, mature split already, just based on what's happened over the summer. And what's really interesting is that if there's, if there's a swing vote here, it's Justice Scalia. I mean, people will be amazed to think that. But the way the justices line up here methodologically is very different than they line up ideologically. And so there's a real mix, um, um, not, not, not the typical one that you would expect. The only thing I'd add is something I've not seen yet raised in the discussion in the popular press or legal newspapers of the case. And that's the question whether Justice yeah. Breyer should even participate in this case. What you may know is that prior to the time of the sentencing guidelines, federal statutes set out what the range of sentences would be, 5 to 10 for this offense. Sometimes it would be mandatory minimum sentences. But then Congress passed what was called the Sentencing Reform Act to try to create more uniformity in sentences, to try to make sentencing more mathematical. And what it basically would provide is for any offense there'd be a base sentence and then there'd be enhancements to it or there could be so-called downward departures. And as part of the Sentencing Reform Act, Congress created an agency the Sentencing Commission, which is part of the judicial branch of government, that promulgates the sentencing guidelines. Well, the first Sentencing Commission was obviously instrumental in creating the system that's considered today in every federal court in sentencing, and that's before the court in the Booker and Fenfen cases. Stephen Breyer, then a First Circuit judge, 
was one of the members of the Sentencing Commission, truly one of the architects of the sentencing guidelines as they exist. Should a justice who played such a key role in developing the sentencing guidelines now participate in considering its constitutionality? There's no indication he's going to recuse himself, um, but I do think it's a very difficult question. My own opinion is he should recuse himself. That I don't think a member of Congress who participated in sponsoring a bill or drafting legislation is then on a federal court should rule on the constitutionality of that, and I think he's in the same position. Um, let me talk about a second area of criminal cases concerning the Fourth Amendment in search and seizure. And there's two really interesting cases where search has already been granted with regard to the Fourth Amendment. One is a case called Illinois versus Cabalas. The question is, can the police use drug dogs to sniff for drugs if there's no reasonable suspicion or probable cause that somebody has drugs present? Police stopped somebody for speeding. I think it was going 71 in a 55 mile an hour zone. Routine thing. Police thought that the driver was acting kind of uncomfortable. But I don't know, having come here from Los Angeles, if I got stopped by the LAPD, I'm always uncomfortable when I'm stopped by the police. <laughs> police had drug sniffing dogs come, and the dogs sniffed drugs in the back of the car in the trunk. They opened it up, and sure enough, they found a large amount of marijuana. And this was a situation where the driver refused to give consent to have the trunk opened. The Illinois Supreme Court said that the use of the drug sniffing dogs violated the Fourth Amendment because there was no reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Does it violate the Fourth Amendment to use drug sniffing dogs in these circumstances is the issue before the court. The other Fourth Amendment case is a case called Mueller versus Mina, and it's a case where I'm involved as co-counsel, very much working on the brief right now on behalf of Mina. Mina is a young Latina. She rented a room in a house in the Valley area of Los Angeles. The police got a search warrant to search the house with regard to certain gang crimes. She was not suspected of any crimes. In fact, the gang that was under suspicion here was an all-male gang. She just happened to be living in the house where the gang members were present. The police went to the house. They had a warrant, and they found her sleeping in her room. They handcuffed her and held her there for a couple of hours, even though she was in no way a target of the investigation. While she was there, an immigration officer came and asked her questions about her immigration status, though she was lawfully in the country. There was never any criminal prosecution of her. No evidence was found against her. So she brought a civil rights suit under 42 United States Code Section 1983, saying her constitutional rights were violated. The police had no basis for handcuffing her, essentially arresting her, and also had no basis for searching her purse, questioning about her immigration status, and the like. The Ninth Circuit ruled in her favor. The Ninth Circuit said that since there's no reason to believe that she was a suspect or that she was going to obstruct the investigation, her arrest violated the Fourth Amendment. And the Ninth Circuit went further and said she shouldn't have been questioned about her immigration status because there's no basis for suspecting her about it. The city sought review here, and the Supreme Court granted review. Um, our brief is due November 11th. Oral argument will be the second week of December. But it raises issues concerning well, when can the police arrest somebody when doing a search of a house? And are there limits on the ability of police to question somebody about immigration status when there's no reason to be suspicious of it? Okay. Uh, the Illinois case, I mean, it's, it's my understanding that, that the, the stop was conceitedly legitimate. Right, that is a conceitedly legitimate traffic stop, and the question is, can you go beyond the scope of this stop and bring out the drug detection dogs? Right. So that would distinguish it, say, from the Indianapolis case from a few years ago, right, the Edmond case, in which they set up a drug, a drug stop, a checkpoint. That's right. And there's no doubt that if the police smelled drugs, if the police saw drugs in the car, they can use all of their senses. But here, it's not the senses of the officers. It's the senses of the dog. Now, on the one hand, the dogs are outside of the car. The dogs are where they're lawfully allowed to be, so can't the police rely on the dog's senses? On the other hand, isn't this functionally a search, because it is what the dogs detect that then becomes the basis for opening the trunk? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on and talk about, uh, really, the, I think the case that has gotten the most public attention so far, and that's the juvenile death penalty case. This is Roper versus Simmons. The court is going to revisit a question it decided one way back in 1989, 
That's when I was a freshman at Duke. Um, and, and reconsider its ruling. The question presented is, the main question presented is whether imposing the death penalty on someone who was 17 years old when he committed a murder is cruel and unusual punishment and therefore violates the 8th and 14th Amendments of the Constitution. Back in 89, there was a case called Stanford versus Kentucky in which the court basically said that 15 years old is going too far, but if you're 16 or 17, the court wasn't prepared to say that it was unconstitutional. Justice O'Connor, interestingly in that case, I went back and looked at her opinion, concurring in part and concurring in the judgment, and she said that there was no national consensus forbidding the imposition of capital punishment on 16 or 17 year old capital murderers. But she said, almost forecasting where we are today, the day may come when there is such general legislative rejection of the execution of 16 or 17 year old capital murderers. Uh, but, that day, uh, but no consensus can be said to have yet developed. I do not believe that day has yet arrived. So unlike you, other cases, say in Lawrence versus Texas, in which she wouldn't go back on her vote in, um, in um, Bowers, right? she went the equal protection route, she may be more open to revisiting her vote in this area. What happened in this particular case was that a couple of terms ago, the court rendered a decision called Atkins versus Virginia, in which the court overturned a previous ruling uh, that came down the same day as Stanford was decided, in which the court held that executing mentally retarded individuals is cruel and unusual, violates the Eighth Amendment. They held this a couple of terms ago. I spent a lot of my time at the court dealing with Atkins claims. A lot of times when people are on death row and about to be executed, they now have, they could raise an Atkins claim they couldn't raise a few years ago. A few years ago, if you were mentally retarded, it didn't matter. The Eighth Amendment didn't, didn't care about it. When the court decided Atkins based on evolving norms of, 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 uh, of justice, of uh, evolving norms of, of what uh, a just moral society can do to criminal defendants, the court revisited their Earth's early ruling and said that, in fact, it is unconstitutional to execute the mentally retarded. The Missouri Supreme Court, in this case, said, basically applied Atkins and said, even though the court itself has not said that executing 16 or 17 year olds is unconstitutional, the court itself revisited its ruling about the mentally retarded, and likewise, we think that the Supreme Court today would find it unconstitutional to execute 16 and 17 year olds. The court granted cert and is going to take up that question. In terms of the data, it's, 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 I did, some, I did some, some counting. Back in 89, of the 37 states that authorized the death penalty, 11 of the 37 prohibited the juvenile death penalty. Seven explicitly allowed it, and then 19 set no minimum age but for, for the death penalty, but nevertheless set the age for adult criminal liability at less than 18. The movement we've seen since then is the federal government, which prohibits the juvenile death penalty, and that includes the entire federal government and the military, and seven states. So whereas 11 states prohibited it back in 89, you have 18 now. Six by statute, one by judicial interpretation. So you have 18 states that pro prohibit the, judicial, uh, the juvenile death penalty, and then you have another 12 that prohibit the death penalty under any circumstances. And interestingly, in Atkins, the mental retardation case, 18 was the number the court found, that 18 states prohibited uh, capital, capital punishment for mentally retarded individuals. So I think that, plus the, the international opinion, there's a whole host of amici who have weighed in, from Nobel Prize winners like uh, Jimmy Carter, Mikhail Gorbachev, to a host of psychological and psychiatric and other medical associations, to legal organizations, to public defender organizations, to states. There's only six states that have joined, uh, that have defended uh, Missouri's action. That's Texas, Virginia, Oklahoma, Utah, Alabama, and Delaware. So I think a lot of these amici, um, frankly, are directed at Justice O'Connor. Um, I think it's somewhat similar to what happened in the Michigan cases, and I do think she's going to be responsive to it. So um, there is, some people think that they granted cert in this case in order to reverse and affirm that it's, unconstitu that, that it's perfectly fine to, to execute 16 and 17 year olds. I don't, I don't have that sense. I have a feeling that Justice O'Connor is, um, is going to be moved, and I think Justice Kennedy may be as well. I think they're going to follow the path that they set out in Anakin. Neil sent me an email this morning, asked if I had a prediction. I said, yes, five to four, Justice O'Connor will be in the majority. <laughs> One interesting that Neil mentions there 
is there's a good deal of attention in the briefs paid to the fact that almost no other country in the world allows the death penalty for crimes committed by juveniles. In Atkins that Neil mentioned, the Supreme Court, at least in a footnote, talked about how almost no other country in the world allows the death penalty for the mentally retarded. In Lawrence versus Texas that Neil mentioned, where the Supreme Court said that under the Due Process Clause, the state cannot punish private consensual homosexual activity, the court mentioned also foreign practices. This is something relatively new before the Supreme Court. They're looking to international practices in deciding the meaning of constitutional provisions. Be interesting to see what happens here. I might point out it's also controversial. A representative from Florida, Representative Feeney, has introduced a resolution condemning the courts from looking at foreign material and coming to decisions. He has like 150 co-sponsors. And I wonder, does that mean American courts aren't supposed to cite to Blackstone? They shouldn't cite to the Bible? But that's at least part of the controversy that surrounds the case. And this is a fight within the court. So you have Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice O'Connor, who are very attentive to what's going on around the world and other, and other uh, legal regimes, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, who are very much opposed. You saw this in Lawrence versus Texas. You saw this in Atkins. And so this is going to, and I think Justice Scalia saw the writing on the world. If you look at international norms, there are lots of issues that he cares about that, um, that may not go his way. I mean, there's five nations, I think, in the world who even allow juvenile death penalty. And it's Pakistan, um, China, maybe Ni Nigeria, you know, it's sort of, it's not, it's not an illustrious list when it comes to human rights. Um, and and we're, we're on that list. Well, let me talk about a second major area, putting aside the criminal procedure cases, and talk about a couple of Commerce Clause cases. For those of you who now have, or have previously had constitutional law, you know the Commerce Clause does a couple of things. One is, it's an authorization for Congress to regulate commerce among the states and with foreign nations with Indian tribes. It is the main source of federal power used for most regulatory legislation. But there's also a way in which the Commerce Clause is a restriction on what state and local governments could do, the so-called dormant Commerce Clause that says the state and local governments can't put an undue burden on our state commerce. The two cases I want to talk about, one fits under each of these categories. The case in terms of Congress's authority to use the Commerce Clause to act is a case that involves medical marijuana. It's Ashcroft versus Raich. This involves whether or not Congress, under its commerce power, can make it a federal crime for people to cultivate and possess small amounts of marijuana for medicinal purposes. As I'm sure you know, California and a number of other states have adopted laws to allow medical use of marijuana. California can do that relative to California criminal law. It can certainly create an exception to California's law prohibiting marijuana. But California can't create an exception, by definition, to the federal marijuana law. The Federal Controlled Substances Act does prohibit growing, or possessing, or distributing marijuana, even for medicinal purposes. Well, the question is, does Congress, under its Commerce Clause power, have the authority to prohibit people from growing and possessing marijuana for their own personal use. For those of you who've had this semester and past year's constitutional law, you know that between 1937 and 1995, the Supreme Court very broadly defined the scope of Congress's commerce power. During that period, not one federal law was struck down as exceeding the scope of Congress's Commerce Clause authority. But then in 1995, in a case called United States versus Lopez, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional the Federal Gun-Free School Zone Act. Federal law made it a federal crime to have farm in a thousand feet of the school. The Supreme Court said, that exceeds the scope of Congress's commerce power. The law is unconstitutional. In the year 2000, a case called United States versus Morrison, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional the civil damages provision of the Violence Against Women Act, a provision of federal law that said victims of gender-motivated violence could sue their assailant in federal court. The Supreme Court, again, in a 5-4 ruling like in Lopez, said that this doesn't involve commerce among the states. Therefore, it's outside the scope of Congress's power. Well, one would then predict that the five justices from the majority in Lopez and Morrison would say growing and using marijuana for medicinal purposes is also outside the scope of Congress's power. They weren't growing it to sell it. They were growing it to use it for medical purposes. But keep in mind who those five justices are. It's Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor, Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas. 
Those are justices who would tend to be more sympathetic to the war on drugs. On the other hand, the four dissenting justices who have dissented in all of the cases limiting Congress power might want here to protect medical use of marijuana. But do they want to narrow the scope of Congress's commerce power? This case has put public interest organizations in a very difficult position because the liberal public interest organizations want to come out in favor of medical use of marijuana, so they want to strike down the federal law but they don't want to see limits put on Congress's commerce power because they're afraid that that will be used then to strike down civil rights statutes. And so, given the unusual posture, what will the court do in this case? And it's one of the really closely watched cases. The other Commerce Clause case I'd mentioned involves the Dormant Commerce Clause that limits the ability of state and local governments with a burden under state commerce. It's a case called Swedenberg versus Kelly. New York has a law that says that wine that's produced in New York can be sent through the mail in New York, but wine from out of state can't be sent through the mail to New York. Other states have this, in fact, there's a companion case coming from Michigan. Now, one would think that this is a violation of the most basic principles of the Dormant Commerce Clause. A state is discriminating against commerce from other states. It's obviously doing so to help its own producers at the expense of out-of-state producers, and that's what the Dormant Commerce Clause is meant to stop. On the other hand, the 21st Amendment, which was adopted after prohibition, gives the states much more latitude to regulate the sale, consumption of alcoholic beverages within the state, and does that make this law permissible when otherwise it would be unconstitutional? Yeah, I think the, the, the Commerce Clause case is, is fascinating for just the reason Erwin identifies. You get to see where the justices, right, where they put their chips. Right? How much do they care about the Commerce Clause? How much do they care about the war on drugs? There are all sorts of federal criminal statutes that, whose constitutionality would seem to be suspect, except that the court routinely denies cert because when it comes to the federal criminal statutes and the war on drugs, well, Lopez and Morrison don't apply there. They never say this, but that seems to be the reasonable, most reasonable inference from the incessant cert denials. I mean, if you're a clerk, one of the greatest cert petitions you can get from the standpoint of not having a lot of work is the felon in possession statute is unconstitutional in light of Lopez and Morrison. And you know, off deny, deny. Well, why? It seems like a pretty good argument. And if all you've got is felon in possession of a firearm, why explain what the necessary relation to, to interstate commerce is? So in this case, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on the conservative majority to not appear to be so outcome-oriented and, and, and political about its Commerce Clause jurisprudence. I just read an article this morning about someone encouraging the federal society to argue that this statute is unconstitutional and, uh, as applied. And in fact, the court could do that and say, in this, this rare instance of growing the stuff for your own personal medicinal use, that's beyond Congress's power. But the broad, you know, most of the applications well within it because you're talking about selling it to other people. Um, the court could come out that way. I, I, don't, I don't know what they'll do, but it, it's sort of, it's gonna, um, it could be a tough question really for every, for every member of the court. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about a couple of statutory discrimination cases. And they're, they're very, uh, two, two important cases. The first is Smith versus Jackson, Mississippi, uh, in which, which concerns the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, specifically whether or not the Age Discrimination and Employment Act allows disparate impact claims, right? Whether disparate impact as opposed to disparate treatment claims are cognizable. And you know just from first year con law that it's much easier to prove disparate impact than disparate treatment. Right? Disparate treatment requires a showing of some kind of invidious motive. And it's not like the, the, the days of the Civil Rights Movement in which discriminators would be very upfront about what they were doing. Right? Some, you can discriminate in all sorts of ways say, that, are, that are difficult to detect. There's a 5-3 circuit split on the issue. The Fifth Circuit said that, in fact, the Age Discrimination Act does not allow disparate impact claims. And this, this is going to have major implications for how effective the statute is going to be in, in preventing age discrimination. The court granted cert on this issue a couple of terms ago and what's, what's called digged it. They dismissed it as improvidently granted and um, really didn't give an explanation. So it's back now and the court is, uh, it looks like the court is gonna, is gonna tell us. It's, it's, I should say that on the one hand, the court doesn't have a great record from the standpoint of, of people who care about, uh, care about statutory causes of action for discrimination. Right? But on the other hand, 
the Age Discrimination Act is modeled almost exactly on Title VII, which prohibits employment discrimination, which the court has held allows disparate impact claims. So we'll get to see in this case uh, sort of which, which, way the court, which way the court goes. The other case that uh, important statutory discrimination case is uh, Jackson versus Birmingham Alabama Board of Education, in which I should say that Duke's own Walter Dellinger is representing the, the petitioner, Roderick Jackson. This is a Title IX case. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 uh, uh, prohibits gender discrimination in programs or services of, this, of the state that receive federal funds. It's modeled on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits race, race and ethnic and national origin discrimination for similar entities. The question presented in this case is whether you can bring retaliation claims for uh, retaliation claims for complaints about unlawful sex discrimination. So here, the petitioner, Roderick Jackson, was a gym teacher and also a girl's, uh, a girl's uh, I think it's basketball? Yeah, girl's basketball coach. And he started to complain that the boys had much better facilities and resources than the girls did. He wasn't fired, but he was relieved of his duties as girls' basketball coach, and he filed suit under Title IX. What the court's going to have to decide is whether or not he can bring a claim for retaliation. What he's saying is, I complained about unlawful sex discrimination, and I was retaliated against. Again, the court has, has a mixed record on claims of statutory discrimination, but it's been very good on Title IX. Right? The, it, it implied a right of action under Title IX when none existed on the face of the statute. Now the question is whether it's going to imply a right of action for retaliation. And I, um, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that, that, that the court is going to continue um, to, to be sympathetic towards Title IX claims, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly by no means a foregone conclusion in light of, light of some recent precedents, specifically a case called Alexander versus Sandoval. The last of the cases that we want to talk about where certs already been granted involve equal protection and additionally immigration. The equal protection case that review has been granted, and I think it's one of the hardest cases of the term, is Johnson versus California. California has a practice of routinely segregating prisoners based on race when they're admitted into the system. Does that violate equal protection? The reason they do this is there are prison gangs in all of the California prisons, and the prison gangs are along racial lines. There is an African-American gang, there is a Latino gang, there is an Asian gang, and there is a white supremacist gang. And as a result of the gangs being separated based on race, prisons often find it necessary to separate prisoners based on race. How should this be dealt with in the prison context? On the one hand, in almost no other context would the court approve routine racial segregation. On the other hand, this is prison. The Supreme Court, in so many areas, said when it's a claim of challenge what prisons are doing, we have to be very deferential to prison authorities. To put it in the language of constitutional law, the Supreme Court says only rational basis review rather than the heightened form of review that would come when fundamental rights are involved. What will the court do in this context? Will it be the same deference, or will the court say, when it comes to racial segregation, it can't just be routine segregation? The other area that I wanted to talk about, what review's already been granted, concerns immigration law. In June of 2001, and I think the date here is important, the Supreme Court decided a case called Zavitis versus Davis. It involved some individuals who had lawfully entered the United States, um, one was from Cambodia, and committed a crime while here. The person was sentenced to prison, served his sentence, and then it was time for him to be released. Well, since he wasn't a citizen, the United States government wanted to deport him. But the United States doesn't have a treaty for deportation or extradition with Cambodia, and there was no place to put him. The country didn't want to let him stay here, couldn't send him back, so they kept him in custody indefinitely. Um, a companion case involved somebody who was born in a displaced persons camp after World War II, claimed to be of Lithuanian origin. Lithuania said, he's not our citizen. We're not taking him back. Um, the United States said, he's not our citizen. And they just kept him locked up indefinitely. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, said it violates federal law to keep non-deportable aliens locked up indefinitely. 
Justice Breyer wrote for the court, joined by Justice Stevens, Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice O'Connor. Well, of course, then September 11th occurs, and many believe that the court would have decided this differently had the case come down after September 11th rather than before. Well, there are two cases this term that pose related issues, a case called Benitez v. Martinez and a case called Crawford v. Martinez. What makes these cases different is these are people who were stopped at the border. Zavidas involved individuals who were lawfully in the country and then committed a crime. Well, these are cases of people who were stopped at the border and there's no place to send them, so they kept here indefinitely, especially involved the Mario Cubans, individuals who came to the country were apprehended. And the issue is, for individuals who were excludable in the first place, who never entered lawfully, can the government keep them locked up forever if there's no country to send them back to? And we'll see, perhaps, whether the court sees September 11th as needing to give the government more authority with regard to dealing with non-citizens. Um, maybe before we take questions, to talk a little bit what the court considered this morning that we might hear about tomorrow. Why don't you talk about your case? Yeah. Okay. Um, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, as Neil alluded to, I have two cert petitions that I filed last spring that the Supreme Court decided this morning, likely decided this morning, whether to take up, and that I'll hear tomorrow morning whether they're taken. One is a case called Van Orden versus Perry, and it involves a Ten Commandments display that's six feet high and three and a half feet wide that's between the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas State Capitol. And the question is, does it violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to have this very prominent Ten Commandments display in such a public place. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit said it does not violate the Establishment Clause. The Fifth Circuit essentially said they believe that the Ten Commandments are now secular. Um, I paid extra and should have brought with me to get a picture of this display put in the cert petition. And Neil can tell you it's not that often they get pictures in the cert petitions. But the picture is so powerful of seeing this large display with big letters that starts, I am the Lord thy God. <laughs> um, there's a flat out split among the circuit. The state of Texas, in its opposition to cert, said, court, we think this is an important issue. You should take the case. And eight states filed an amicus brief encouraging the court to take the case. Um, there are also two other Ten Commandment cases that were being considered this morning, both involving Ten Commandments displays in schools. So my prediction is they're going to take one or more of these Ten Commandments cases. We'll see if it's this one. Um, the other case where I filed a cert petition is a case called Tory versus Cochran. Ulysses Tory, my client, um, had previously been a client of the prominent attorney in Los Angeles, Johnny Cochran. He thought that Johnny Cochran didn't treat him well. And so after Johnny Cochran became famous as a result of that obscure trial that occurred in the mid-1990s in Los Angeles, um, Tory marched up and down in front of Johnny Cochran's office carrying signs saying, Johnny Cochran ripped me off. In <laughs> fact, he even hired some homeless people to march up and down in front of Johnny Cochran's <laughs> office. In a classic example of using a cannon to get a gnat, Johnny Cochran sued Ulysses Tory for defamation. The judge awarded no damages to Johnny Cochran, because there weren't any damages, but he issued an injunction saying that Ulysses Tory and his wife, and his wife was never part of any of this, can never say anything about Johnny Cochran in any public place. Not now, not ever. Not even, can't they say defamatory things? They couldn't walk down the street and say to one another, you know, Johnny Cochran did a really good job in the OJ case. The California Court of Appeal upheld this saying a permanent injunction on speech is not a prior restraint. Now, for those of you who study First Amendment law, if anything seems clear, an injunction is the classic prior restraint. The California Supreme Court denied review with two justices dissenting from the denial of review, and I'm seeking review in the United States Supreme Court. Um, I'm less confident that they'll grant in that case than the Ten Commandments case. The more confidence they grant that I'll win. And so <laughs> we'll see tomorrow whether either or both these cases are granted. Do you want to talk briefly about the Arlupa case before questions? Uh, we should ask. There's questions? Question. questions? Okay. Yeah. Questions no, about no. any of this? Oh, Chris, I don't know if we cut you off. Any comments? Take it away. Matt? Um, I don't remember the name of the law one, but uh, Blame your professor. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Wickard? <laughs> In the corn case. Yeah, the corn. Wheat. 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 Wickard versus Filburn. Right. What's the difference between that and the drug case? Well, 
On the one hand, there may be no difference. And the court may say, just as we have, well, just so everyone who hasn't had the case yet, Wickard versus Filburn involved a federal law that limited the amount of wheat that farmers could grow for their own home consumption. A farmer challenged the law by arguing, what I grow for my family to eat has nothing to do with interstate commerce. But the Supreme Court upheld the law as constitutional within the scope of Congress's commerce power. And in all of the cases in the last decade, limiting Congress's commerce authority, the court cites approvingly to Wickard. So maybe the opinion the court will write in this case is, in Wickard we held that growing a crop is part of interstate commerce. This is growing a crop. This is with interstate commerce. So the law putting marijuana in the Controlled Substance Act is constitutional. But there's a problem with that. In Wickard, the core of what the Supreme Court said is that the single largest variable affecting interstate wheat prices is homegrown wheat. The Supreme Court said that homegrown wheat, when you look at all of the wheat grown for home consumption, cumulatively has a substantial effect on interstate wheat prices. And that's why Congress could regulate homegrown wheat. I don't think that Congress could do that for homegrown marijuana, <laughs> so the distinction becomes difficult. Yeah, another problem is how, in fact, is Wickard reconcilable with Lopez and Morrison? I mean, how? You know, I mean, the court, I think, implicitly overruled 60 years of Commerce Clause jurisprudence without saying so. So, I mean, yeah. You know. Your thoughts Gee, on that's that? That's a little bold. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think my prediction is this is nine zip in favor of the U.S. government because it uh, implicates a part of Lopez that uh, Justice Rehnquist threw into his opinion, in which, in which he was describing what the Gun Free School Zone Act was not. He said it was not part of a comprehensive federal regulatory scheme. And I think that's the hook on which the conservative justices can hang this opinion if they want to, which is to say, if you assume at step one the federal government has plenary constitutional authority to shut down the interstate market in, um, what are they, ca class one or class four? I keep forgetting the way the uh, prohibited, prohibited uh, drugs and medication. They could reasonably conclude that Controlling any production of it was a necessary and proper means to accomplishing that comprehensive state regulatory program. Both Lopez and Morrison are distinguishable from the medical marijuana case on the grounds that there's no other federal regulatory scheme sitting in the background that the government was arguing this was a, in, in statute. Uh, this was an effectuation of. Um, so that, I think, gives the conservatives a chance to say, well, this is, this, is the this is an instance of the cases that we said were never covered by our Lopez and Morrison restrictions. And you know that four justices are going to uphold the statute. I think despite their predilections to be in favor of medical marijuana, I think they, the four justices who are dissenting the commerce cases find the threat to federal authority posed by Lopez and Morrison to be the battle that's more important to be fighting at this point. So it, there is a problem in making it look like Wickard, which uh, the dissent tried to do in the Ninth Circuit. Um, but there is an alternative way of looking at it as, as not quite the same fact pattern that Lopez and Morrison presented. More questions? The case that you remember from Con Law about standing is a case called City of Los Angeles versus Lyons. And it was a plaintiff who had been subjected to a chokehold seeking an injunction to stop the police in Los Angeles from using the chokehold again in the future, except where necessary to protect the officer's life or safety. But the key about Lyons is the plaintiff was suing for an injunction. And the Supreme Court said he didn't have standing to seek an injunction because he couldn't show that he would likely be choked again in the future. 
Mina is not seeking an injunction. She's just seeking money damages. And the Supreme Court in Lyons was clear that Lyons could sue the police for damages. That doesn't have any standing problems. Well, likewise, in the Mina case, she has standing to seek the damages. And the question is, is there a violation of the Fourth Amendment here? Right. Have the juvenile death penalty. Isn't it? I mean, isn't it almost the two nations that even have the death penalty? Well, I think it. I think it depends on the justice. I think. I mean, certainly, what's going to be most persuasive to the justices whose votes people want are going to be movements since '89. Right. It's not going to be. You know, do they have the death penalty at all? Although, if more states don't have the death penalty at all, that's going to matter. But the fact that you have seven states and the federal government saying no juvenile death penalty, aside from what the rest of the world is doing, aside from whether you allow the death penalty at all, I think that's going to be significant. And I also think for certain justices like Justice O'Connor, the, the views of the rest of the world, I mean, having um, US diplomats saying that uh, this isn't some of the amici, that the, that the greatest source of embarrassment, the greatest source of anger towards America, this was back in the, the first Gulf War, was not Iraq, was not Bosnia, it was, it was the US and execution policies. Um, so for people like Scalia uh, and, and Thomas, they'll say, so what? But for someone like Justice O'Connor, you know, she travels to all these places. She, um, it means a lot to her. So. In the Atkins case on the death penalty from the charted, there was a long exchange really between Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer while sitting on the bench at oral argument of how do you count the states? Do you count the states that don't have the death penalty at all in evaluating this? And it is an unusual area of constitutional law where the number of states that have adopted a practice or repealed a practice gets so much weight. Um, the other thing is two years ago, Sarah Beale and I were at a conference of federal appellate judges where Justice O'Connor gave a speech and she talked about why American courts should look more at foreign courts and foreign practices. We mentioned at the very beginning how a lot of the justices spend their summer in Europe quite literally teaching at these law school <laughs> programs for American students. And I think some of why just so Connor's expressing that view and the other just are looking for foreign material is their experience in going to Europe in the summer, being exposed to foreign judges and foreign students and foreign material. I apologize for coming late, so you may have discussed this. I'm wondering about the particular role that you guys see O'Connor playing in this, this term. And if there are any, in particular, not necessarily cases, but areas of law where you think she has a yeah, I think in the, the juvenile death penalty case, and I think in the statutory discrimination cases, um, I think she's gonna, it's gonna, she's gonna, she's gonna play a large role. Um, in the juvenile death penalty cases, I think she's very attentive to what's going on around the world. I think she's sort of, as I, I mentioned earlier. If you look at her opinion back in 89, in which she says perhaps the day will, want, will come when such a consensus will exist for outlawing ju the juvenile death penalty. So I think she's given herself room in which to operate. I think in the Title IX case, the fact that it's about, uh, about gender discrimination is going to matter to her and matter quite, quite a bit. Um, so I think those are two areas in which, which her vote may be needed. Uh, Do you see the, the role of gender in Um, that's certainly what I was thinking uh, as I was speaking, yeah. And this, was, this was the FMLA case, uh, a state sovereign immunity case, in which uh, she, she formed a, a, well, a fifth vote, even though the, the chief wrote the opinion, um, to, uphold, to uphold the statute. Yeah. Please. Regarding the um, federal uh, sentencing guidelines, if they determine that they are unconstitutional, um, must they necessarily apply it retroactively? Could they decide, well, just from here on, to save the sort of all the courts that would be, all those cases from having to be re-litigated? Yeah, the, it, it's the short, there's a whole complicated retroactivity jurisprudence that the court has. The short answer is that it's not going to be, it's not going to be retroactive. The court has held in last term in Shiro versus, versus Summerlin, right, that um, 
that Ring is not retroactive. And Ring was uh, in a case like Blakely that applied to the death penalty. So they're not going to hold, hold death penalty cases retroactive. Right? The idea that they're going to hold the guidelines in general retroactive seems quite unlikely. So no, they're not going to go back to the beginning of the guidelines. But even without being retroactive, you still have literally tens of thousands of criminal convictions that are in play. I might disagree just a bit with that. Blakely is based on a decision from 2000 called Apprendi versus New Jersey. Apprendi involved a man who fired a gun into a home owned by an African American family. He made statements that he did this because he didn't want a black family living in his neighborhood. He pled guilty to a crime that is sentenced to five to ten years in prison. But New Jersey, like many states, has a hate crime law that provides for a penalty enhancement for hate motivated crime. He was sentenced to 12 years. And the Supreme Court said that hate motivation had to be found by the jury beyond a reasonable doubt, not by the judge. And that's what Blakely is based on. I think the question is, what about the period between 2000 and 2004? If the sentencing guidelines are unconstitutional, is it everything from 2000 to 2004, or is it only from the day Booker and Fenfen is decided? The case that Neil mentioned involved death sentences that were imposed before 2000, and the Supreme Court was unwilling to have Apprendi apply to that. But the issue of what about post-2000, I think, is a different question. I think that's right. I think that's right. I think it, it, it could very well be that they'll say from Apprendi on in 2000. Well, when yeah. you said that there's still tens of thousands of convictions that are in question, right. what do you mean by that? I mean, ones that are currently on appeal? Or? Yeah, yeah, conviction, yeah, the cr criminal convictions that haven't become final. Yeah. We have a million people incarcerated in this country. Every year we try a lot of them and convict them. Um, i just say one more thing about Justice Breyer. I think it is the point that Irwin made about Justice Breyer is quite interesting. I suppose it's because I haven't seen anybody moving to remove him that it may not be getting uh, much play. But Justice Breyer is actually very close to the father <laughs> of the sentencing guidelines. He was chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time Justice Kennedy, uh, Justice Kennedy, Senator Kennedy was uh, chairman. And the sentencing guidelines is their baby. So serving on a commission after it's established and implementing it and then being asked to rule whether it's constitutional or not is one question. That's, but this is the guy who actually wrote. <laughs> Now, he didn't have a vote, <laughs> as Neil said. But as much as anybody, he's responsible for the form of the sentencing guidelines as it was, it was uh, uh, eventually enacted. So I, I do think that there is a substantial question. Now, having said that, there's a rather significant set of examples one could give of Supreme Court justices who've been very intimately involved in uh, some prior life in some transaction, including major legislation, that they're, they're then appointed to the bench and are asked to, uh, to review. Uh, so it's not at all clear that he would, but I do think it's a very serious question. And we learned last year that whether a justice recuses himself or herself is entirely up to the individual justice, that the court doesn't play any role in that. It's left to the conscience of the person. Do we have time for one more question? Sure. Um, could you say a little more about what you mean about the timing? Um, I worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philip, and one of the issues that we faced was there was not a whole lot of guidance in the uh, opinion and there was a lot of uh, it came out that there was a concern. Right. So there's this um, our public counsel felt that the Supreme Court dropped this bombshell and then got out of town and <laughs> Oh, okay, now I'm okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. And I don't know how the opinion directly gets to that, but that was the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and the Third Circuit just sort of tried to question up and then the public were so confused. So, do you have any idea? Was there a specific, like, was there any philosophy that went into that kind of decision? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, what, what, you're, what you're talking about is sort of subtextual <laughs> motives um, that the justices may have had in releasing the opinion at a certain time, and that's not something that I could really talk about publicly. I, 
so I'll just I'll just leave it I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but I, I um, just just query whether um, well I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, in terms of what the opinion in terms of what the opinion will look like, I think it, lots of folks said that the court really um, not just dropped the bomb but dropped the ball. I mean, Justice Scalia in a footnote in a very poker face manner says, "Well, the federal guidelines are not before us, and we express no opinion." And you know you have people around the country, lawyers on well prosecutors, criminal defense lawyers, judges, think, what are you talking about? Right, this language seems like it applies squarely, so what do you mean you're not addressing it? I think that, that uh, the court is, is very reasonably subject to criticism for deciding the case in the way it did and also proceeding in the way it did. It could have, it could have granted a federal guidelines case as well and considered them together. It could have delayed ruling in Blakely and then granted a federal guidelines case and, and decided them together before sending the system into such an uproar. So I think there's certainly legitimate reason to criticize how the court went about it. And I also think they're going to be attentive to that um, and try not, to, try not to repeat it again. I'm going to actually disagree. Um, I get to defend Justice Scalia here. And I don't get to do that all that often. Um, I think that given that the case wasn't argued, I think it was argued in February, is that right? Um, it's natural that cases that are argued at that point of the calendar, especially major cases, come down in June. I don't think that the court was playing any game about saying, we're going to hold it and then drop this bombshell. And, and I just think. You're not disagreeing with me. I didn't speak. No, no, I was getting to the second point. Okay. I was going to say, well, no, no, you, you were giving us. I disagree with that. No, no. And so my sense and is. Even though that, you can't comment on it. Right. right. So <laughs> and there weren't any of, dissents. Right. These things take time. My sense is, in terms of the timing, a major case that's argued after the first of the year is likely to come down in, in June. So there's nothing extraordinary. But then I don't criticize the court for keeping the guidelines issue up. And I just think that's the way our law develops, especially in a major year. The court had before it the Washington guidelines system. They found that the jury in this case should have determined that there was deliberate cruelty in the kidnapping, not the judge. They knew that this poses issues with regard to the guidelines, but the guidelines are a separate question. And I think they're better off deciding this and then saying to the lawyers, OK, in light of this, come brief for us whether you think the guidelines are constitutional, rather than holding this until they got a guidelines case. I think they have several options of what they can do. One possibility is to say that this makes the guidelines unconstitutional because you can't sever the constitutional from the unconstitutional part. That's what the Sixth Circuit initially said after Blakely, though on banc that was vacated. A second possibility is to say, oh, the guidelines are different than the Washington scheme, and therefore this has nothing to do with the guidelines, which is what the Fourth and Fifth Circuit said. Um, I think it's a hard argument to make, but we could certainly develop ways in which the federal sentencing guidelines are different than what they invalidated in Blakely. The final possibility is to say, Yes, this applies to the guidelines. What it means is that certain things are going to have to be found by the jury rather than the judge in sentencing. And when those things come up, we're going to just need to structure the proceedings for the jury to determine it rather than the judge. And that's what the Ninth Circuit said. And I've gone back and forth in my own mind between whether they're going to invalidate the guidelines altogether or take the Ninth Circuit's approach saying certain things are going to have to be found by the jury. I don't think they can take the middle course. I just don't think there's a plausible basis for saying that this has, Blakely has nothing to do with the guidelines. But I should tell you as I give that prediction, maybe the last thing I say, in mid-June before Blakely came down, I had the occasion of speaking at a national conference of federal district court judges. And it was to cover what the court had already decided and preview it was there. And I got to Blakely and I said, you know, if the Supreme Court holds that Apprendi applies to this sentence, this is going to affect all of you in this room because this is going to put the federal sentencing guidelines in doubt. I said, I don't think there's any way that the Supreme Court's <laughs> going to do that. They're going to say Apprendi applies the sentences greater than the statutory maximum. And the only good thing is no one remembers the predictions given by law professors. Yeah. So <laughs> you can take my prediction with a large grain of salt. It is true that they took these two cases on something that you might call an emergency petition by the, by the SG, who said, all, in effect, all is chaos out there in federal sentencing land. And by the way, could you hear these first? And so they're the very first cases the court's going to hear. Yeah. So the footnote notwithstanding, the repercussions have, in fact, been right. enormous. And we will hear more. Yeah, and the court said, well, no, we're not going to hear it in September, because that would almost we'd be confessing error. right? We'd be, right. Saying, we'd be saying that we, were, we, we shouldn't have gone about it this way. So we'll wait till the new term. We're not going to rush. Oh, but we'll hear it on the first day of the new term in a special afternoon session. You know, so um, I, I don't know. Query whether the court would have done it again the same way if they knew, uh, if they knew then what they know now. Well, I think the first edition of the Neil and Irwin show has been a great success. And if you'll join me in applauding them, we'll bring them back next year.